Hello, welcome to a new show. I think most people who are watching this will already know the faces on their screens right now. It's me, Paul Cope, and Gareth Roberts from the Anfield Rap. Handsome Gareth, thanks for joining me, mate. No worries, mate. Pleasure. So this is, as, as everyone who's tuned in so far knows, my new channel, talking about all kinds of things, emotional well-being, psychology, personal development. And I thought we're going to be talking about a lot of serious stuff over the weeks. And it'd be nice to mix that up a little bit and get me mates on and have a chat and just see where it goes. Yeah. And we're, we're open to, we've already asked some questions on Twitter. We're very much open to this show being named. The working title is Bellens Talking Shit. I, I, like your, I like your one, actually, with Cope in Your Heart. <laughs> that, that's one of my favourites so far, to be honest. I think we, we oh, might have... There was another one, wasn't there? Uh, was it coping mechanism or something? Yeah, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I'm dis, I'm dis, I'm just dis, disregarding anything. I mean, you, your one, you've done well to get your one through, actually, and me like it. Because what I think what everyone forgets when they do jokes around my surname is I've had this surname for forty years. Like the, people were doing these jokes when I was three. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So the the vast majority of them are not new to me. Yeah, but I. I'm, I'm, I am. You've done well to get me to get me to like with coping your heart. I think that's good. Um, so I, I wanted to start firstly with letting everyone know where we are because I think people don't even know about that, do they? So where, where do you where do you hold up? What's your setup right now? So I'm in um, the sort of back room, stroke kitchen, dining room type area of of my flat. Uh, which is in the south end of Liverpool, uh, near Lark Lane. Um, it's got no windows, which is not ideal. Um, the only window in this floor of the flat is in the the sitting room, living room type area. I did consider swapping it round, but it, it just seemed like too much work. But I think, in general, the accepted wisdom is that, you know, if you are going to work from home, it is nice to have a window um, and I, I can definitely see why. I mean, I remember I remember speaking to uh, Andy Hunter years ago, who's the, for those that don't know, is the Merseyside football correspondent for The Guardian. Uh, good lad for a blue nose. Uh, he, hates me, he hates me telling everyone that he's a blue nose as well, so don't tell him. Um, but I remember, I remember saying to him, like, you know, I, I really wish, like, I had your job, essentially. Not that I was trying to steal his job, but I just thought, you know, be boss that, wouldn't it? Writing about Liverpool and Everton every day, going to all the games and all that. And he was like, yeah, you know, it, it is good. But he said it's highs and lows. And he's like, you know, for instance, he's like, you know, I work for The Guardian and he said the officers are in London. And he's like, so I'm just like in my gaff every day, you know, apart from when I'm going to press conferences, matches, etc. And I said, well, yeah, well, what's wrong with that? And he was like, well, I'm looking out the window. And he said, and I'm getting really excited when a blackbird lands on the grass. You know what I mean? It's that kind of situation. <laughs> Whereas like currently I haven't got that. So if I sit here for any length of time, there's nothing, you know what I mean? Like if I sit, if I sat in the other room, and there's a, there's a tree there, and sometimes a squirrel runs up and down and things like that. So maybe I should swap them around. I don't know. I mean, uh, but but for now, yeah, back back room. Yeah, to to be honest, mate. Like for for all the books I've read, I don't think most personal development books. I don't think even cover that. I think they just all assume we know you need a window. I know. So you know. You, you basically put yourself in a prison cell for for isolation. And how many, how many hours a day are you in there? So, I mean, I do try and shake it up. So, I, I don't, I mean, you're supposed to take screen breaks anyway, aren't you? And that kind of thing. Um, I'm also sort of, you know, on a very strict diet of, of how much news I'm taking in. I know, so, you know, it's very, very easy to end up on the internet on news sites and all that kind of stuff. It's also very easy to end up watching rolling news and I am doing neither um, because I don't think it's good for you right now so what I'm doing is mainly just listening to six music because it is what it says on the tin music uh, I think music great for the soul as well um, I find myself like really sort of rediscovering bands and getting into new bands and listening to way more than I normally do so that's been great and yeah on the news I'm just I'm just doing like half an hour to an hour a day and that's it so I'm tending to do that sort of around about tea time, like once I've made myself an evening meal, sit down with that and what, and take a little bit in then. And you're not, you're not missing out on anything. I, th I think, you know, there's this, this like, you know, I'm missing some like, you know, th you're not, you're really not, because it's always summed up. 
you know, the BBC, to be fair to the BBC, if you go on their news website, they, ha- they will bullet, they bullet point the main points at the top, and then it's up to you how much more you go in depth from there. And once you've read the bullet points, you're like, okay, I know where we're at. Turn it off and go and do something nice. So, yeah, I've, um, I'm trying not to sit in here exclusively to, to, for too long. I'm making sure that I'm either doing a little bit of exercise or going for a walk or both. Although I think I went a bit too far on that score uh, the other day because for two days now, my calves are in absolute bulk. Like I'm, yeah. like I'm, like I'm walking like a granddad up and down the stairs. Like I mean, like, and I've had loads of baths to just try and ease the pain. Honestly, they're they're, they're on fire. Like I did like an all body workout thing for like 20, 25 minutes, and it's absolutely ruined me legs. And who was like, that with? You you mentioned this the other day. Who was it with? Oh, hang on, I might have a look here. Uh, you, you haven't gone down the Joe Wicks route, have you? You've gone with no. Yeah. No, I'm, I, I, this fella is called... Uh, I mean, it's just a random one that, that I found on Google. He's good, to be fair. He's called uh, Bully Juice, which is um, a bit of a mad name. But, um, but yeah, he's got a 20-minute full-body workout there, no equipment on YouTube. Um, it's to be fair, it's had half a million views that, and he only put it up in February. Um, so he, you know, the fella knows what he's doing, and and it was like I, I did it, and I thought it's simple enough, it's not too hard. It's you know, it got you got a sweat on, you got a bit out of breath, but it wasn't like oh my god, he's absolutely killed me here. But then my body told me otherwise a few hours later. So I'm obviously unfit, uh, so I'm going to try and do something about that during this time. See, this is this is the bit they're not talking about, isn't it? When when you've got the likes of Joe Wicks and this fella Bully Juice trying to get people to exercise, but they're not bearing in mind is that all the people who don't exercise, like and I'm, I factor myself in with that a lot of the time. If you overdo it, you're gonna, you're going to do yourself more harm than good. Yeah, yeah, and I mean I um I've been going for a walk regularly, and like you know obviously that's fine, and, and that's sort of like something your body's used to, and like you know you sort of, you feel good for it anyway. I, I, you know going outside is good, obviously. But yeah, doing something that you don't normally do, obviously your body's like, whoa, what are you up to here? So like, I, I started off, uh, I downloaded the Nike app and I just did like a 10 minute workout off that. And it was good. And I think this is the thing as well. Like I think loads of people get put off doing things. And I sent you something before that I thought was really good. Because um, they think it requires loads and loads of time or prep or commitment. Honestly, the, on the Nike app, it's free. It's dead easy, and you can scroll to do a workout. You can find one you like, and they've got 10-minute ones on there for, for beginners. And I just thought, well, that'll do me, because essentially I am a beginner. I, I mean, I've been to the gym in, in the past. I've been in shape in the past. I'm not going to the gym at the moment, and I'm not in shape, so I need to start at the start. So I started with a 10-minute one, and it was good, and I felt good for doing it. And I thought, okay, next day I'll do 20 minutes, and that's where it all went wrong. So... I might I might wind myself back to the ten minute one, but and then I'll go back up to the twenty, and you know I'll just see how we get on. But I, I've enjoyed doing it. I mean, it's um goes without saying. I mean, you know, there's loads written said and all the rest of it about you know the benefits of exercise, and I think right now we all we all need it. The little mental lift that you get from it, you know, you get you get a little rush off uh, doing a little workout, and and you feel good as well. I mean. You know, you only know that I did that twenty-minute one because I was slightly late doing the uh, doing some content from for the Anfield Rapid Because basically, I thought I was looking at the watch, going, "Okay, I've got time to do that. I've got time to clean myself up afterwards, and then I can be in front of the screen ready to do this show." But I, I needed more time than I thought to actually just sit on the couch, going, <laughs> "Jesus Christ!" <laughs> it feels like it feels like content this to me, mate. I think you're missing a trick. This I've I've got getting fit with Gareth Roberts as a as a video series. You could I mean you don't have to do it in the room with no windows, but I think I think people would lap this up. Maybe they would. I mean you know look I've I've thought before like if someone wanted to like I said me had it in my mind I was sort of like you know if there was like a because there's loads of personal trainers isn't there and I know a lot of them now have moved to online and it must be difficult for them. I do think I do think about them a little bit because. You know, you've got all this free stuff kicking around. Mm. If you were, if you regularly had clients at the gym and you were, and a lot of them are, are self-employed, and obviously there are now things in place for self-employed, but it, for a while there, there wasn't. And so, you know, it must have been some real worries. But I thought, yeah, I wonder what they're going to do. Like, I seen one online the other day who's local, 
and uh, he's charging like three pound for like something that you can like log into. Um, and I, I would presume, I would hope anyway, that his regular clients would still do that because it's not just about working out in that circumstance. It's about the personal touch and the advice and seeing people like that, I presume you would see when you go in the gym and things like that. So I, I hope people like that are, are still getting support. But, but yeah, but I did think, I have thought about the, it, it being content before because, you know, like, you see, you see stuff that personal trainers share anyway, you know, like of clients and transformations from, you know, this to this and all that kind of thing. And I kept thinking, well, I wonder if one of them wants to, you know, help me out and I'd help them out and I'd push their stuff or whatever. But I never got anywhere with it. But yeah, I mean, if anyone's watching and they want to get me into shape, bring it on. Now could be the time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love this. What pe- pe- Like behind the scenes, what people don't realise is once you're involved in like, and I'm getting this myself now, launching my own YouTube channel and podcast. But because I've been involved doing stuff with the Anfield Rock for so long, I don't think people realise just how much your brain is constantly thinking about content, right. isn't it? Yeah. Like every yeah. little thing that happens, you everyone looks at each other and thinks, could this be a could this be a podcast? And it, I, Neil, for for those who are watching who, who know Neil Atkinson as well, one one of the the main hosts of the Anfield Rock, he's constantly said to me over the past, and it always makes me laugh please don't give me any ideas. Like, I just constantly get people coming up to me going, came with an idea the other day. We're sitting in the back, came up with the idea for a show. Which I love. And I, it, it, you, you do end up like that. You do end up like that. There's no two ways about it. I'm actually thinking about doing something. Obviously, um, the kids are being homeschooled at the moment. And um, Kelly is coming up with all kinds of ideas with them. And, like, you know, she's a photographer, so she did some... She did some photography with them and got them to think about points of view and stuff like that the other day, which I thought was good. But she said to me, like, you know, why don't you um, do something with them on, like, online content? You know, like, talk about sort of where the ideas come from, how you do it, how you structure it, what type of things you should be thinking about and all that. And I was like, yeah, okay. So I'm going to do a little – I'm going to come up with a content lesson uh, for the kids. But, I mean, one of the things that I will definitely say is – you know, if it's something that you're passionate about and something that you're into, you will find that you're constantly having ideas. And that's a good thing. I mean, I think, you know, even when we're, when I watch, like, mainstream stuff, you know, I wouldn't regard us still at the Anfield app as, as mainstream. You know, it's still slightly off to the left. It's more mainstream than perhaps it once was. But, it, like, you know, even if you're watching, like, Sky right now, they're doing stuff like this. You know, they've got, like, you know... Neville and Carragher talking over Skype and things like that because everyone's everyone's in the same boat right now. You know, the, the, this situation, not just in media, in general, in life, is is a huge leveler. And so, you know, all of a sudden, I mean, like, you know, I interviewed um, Jose Enrique the other day, but like this, and it was mad. It was it was mad. You know, like I got up, got dressed, had something to eat, made a brew, and then sat down and had Jose Enrique on my screen, and and. I, what I liked about it as well was, you know, like, I don't know him, obviously, I've never met him, and, and like, I've just seen him over the screen, but what was nice was that, you know, the way when you do something like this, and or, or you meet in a room, you do a podcast, or you go on a radio show, whatever, there's always a pre-chat before the chat, and, like, I was thinking, well, in this circumstance with Jose, is the pre-chat going to be a little bit awkward, because, you know, I don't know him, do I? And then the pre-chat was absolutely sound. And he was like, straight away, I thought, it'll be good this, because he's a nice fella. Because you know what I mean? Because I sat down, and then I tried to ring him, and he didn't answer. And I thought, oh, shit. Have I got the wrong address? Or, you know, have I fucked up? Blah, blah, blah. Then he rang me back. And I was like, here he is. And I was like, hiya, mate. Thank, thanks very much for doing that. And he's like, no problem, and all that. And then we were talking about the coronavirus crisis, like everyone is doing. And then he was like, you know, how, how are you coping with it, mate? And I was like, well, I'm, you know, I'm in this flat on my Todd and it's a bit shit and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, um, it's all about routine. He's like, you know, I've got a routine. He's like, from when, from my football days and I still stick to it. I get up every day, I do a workout. I think about what I'm eating and all that. He's going through all that kind of stuff. And then he said, well, what about you? Have you got kids? Are you seeing your kids regularly? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm seeing them. Like I said, I don't live with them now, but I see them, yeah. And he's like, um, well, don't worry, mate, you know, it, 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 it'll it pass. It's not always going to be like this. Stay positive and all this. And I was like, this is boss. A little, <laughs> a little pep talk of Jose Enrique. I mean, I could do with this every day, you know what I mean? Just bell him. Bell him in the morning. Say, go on, Jose, get me going, lad. Let's go. Do you know what I mean? He was great. 
you could probably get him as your personal trainer and coach, wouldn't you? He'll have time on his hands. Well, he was, I mean, do you, do you remember the, the the shape he was in when he was at Liverpool? We talked about that on the interview. I said, like, you know, you've always been, like, a big lad upstairs. And I said, you know, that sort of style you had, that sort of, like, bowl through a china shop type style. I said, was that on purpose? Like, did you, you know, where did that come from? Was it coached? You know, did you just develop it? And he said, no, no. He said, like you said, he said, I was, I've always been known, I've always been conscious that, like, I'm strong. And that, you know, like, and, and so I played on that. I knew that. I knew I could brush people aside. I knew I could get in the box and, and like, push a few people off. And I was like, it's, it's good, that, isn't it? I mean, like, you know, because you you kind of think at the very, very, very top level of sports, everything will be really scientific, or I do anyway. And I was thinking, you know, someone will have sat him down and said, you know, you do this and you do that and you run there. And But no, he just developed it because he knew it was quite hard. <laughs> I love that. It's it's really interesting. And for, for anyone who's who's listening who's not an Anfield app subscriber, where those interviews I think are brilliant. Some of the best parts of it, the videos, it's worth having a look. Um, but it, one of the things I love about doing this sort of stuff, and generally, I think in life, most people, when we look at stuff that we've never been involved with, you can. It's and this is when I talk to people about changing careers and starting a business and stuff. You can be, it can be intimidating to do stuff. Yeah. But once you're in behind the scenes, it's mad, isn't it? It's like it's like the scene in The Wizard of Oz where you think it's this grand wizard and all of a sudden you, you realise it's just little old fellas running stuff. I always remember when I went down to do Sky Sports News, the transfer deadline day for, for the Anfield rap. And that was one of my biggest ones because Sky Sports, like news centre down in London, is unreal. It's like a, it's like a little country of its, of its own. It's got restaurants yeah, yeah. and all that. And I used to work in London a long time ago for, for a big law firm, so sort of knew that type of setup. But even for me, it was it was impressive. It was like next level stuff. But I remember we're, we're down there, and they had they had fan groups, like people from all different fan channels, all chatting, and you would just be there. And the, the lads running the day for Sky, like the the fellas behind the scenes, they were literally making stuff up as they were going along. They were turning yeah. to us and going right. We've got to do a fifteen minute section, and we've got to start recording it in twenty minutes. Um, any ideas? And we were all looking at each other thinking, we're all thinking we're from like fan channels, like people just doing their own YouTube stuff, their own podcasts. And we're all like, well, we all just make it up as we go along. But I bet your sky is really organized and really professional. Absolutely not. Uh-huh. Like there is not a great, like obviously, obviously there's a wider grand plan, but on the day it was dead interesting to watch. Someone said to, to a mate of mine once ages ago, it was a senior lawyer in a law firm. My mate was, like complaining about decisions that have been made. And he said to her, can I just stop you? I know you assume from your position that everything is thought through. So there must be like thinking and reasoning behind everything. And therefore you get annoyed. He went, I can promise you there's not not that much thought going into any of it. It's just random mad stuff. And I was like, yeah, that, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. So much of it is, I mean, you know, um, I, I used to work in journalism and um, I ended up in some places that, you know, I wouldn't have expected to end up in. So, you know, I ended up in the Daily Mirror at, in Canary Wharf, um, did some work down there. And, you know, once upon a time, if, when I was reading the Mirror, when I was like a teenager thinking about being a journalist, and I used to see that address and be like, wow, and what must it be like in there? And imagine being like Brian Reed and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And, and it's the same thing, yeah, when you get in there, it's just desks, it's just people, it's ideas, it's a way of working. And, yeah, it, it is really easy to, to to build it up into something that it really isn't. I mean, it's the same, you know, I did some stuff for the BBC in Salford, and that's a, a similar situation to what, what, what it sounds like with it, with Sky, and that, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, the studios, there's all these like mad little pod areas where you can have meetings. There's little mini studios where you can go and do telephone calls. The canteen's huge. And there's like, there's the, the canteen for normal people like me when I was doing a shift there. And then there's like another canteen um, where there's like a chef producing the, like unbelievable stuff and all that. And that's obviously for like, you know, your stars who've got loads of money or whatever, but it's just mad. But that, but you know, also like even when you were talking then I was thinking like, you know, so BBC Sport, one of BBC Sport's biggest hits, if you like, in terms of you know why people go to the website and what they read, 
is the gossip column. Yeah. And and all the got I, I mean, I've been there when the gossip column is being produced, and obviously all it is is a lad sitting at a computer, you know, looking to see what the headlines are. I, I think they get sent. You know, they get sent like, you know, the the front pages and the back pages of papers and things like that anyway, because it obviously benefits the papers to be mentioned on the BBC. Mm -hmm. And it's just collating that and, you know, putting the links in and, you know, doing all the, the, you know, the the back end stuff that you wouldn't really think about and then putting it out there. And it's like, that isn't complicated. That isn't beyond someone with, you know, basic sports knowledge and, you know, a a good grasp of English, if you like. But you, you, you do... I think you do naturally sort of put things on pedestals, don't you? It's like, you know, even like the structure of journalism, you know, you start off on like a weekly newspaper or a free newspaper and you look at people at the Echo and think, wow, you know, wish I was in that newsroom, wish I worked there, wish I did that. Then you get in there and you're like, this is just the same. And then you're like, oh, wow, imagine working on a national. That would be unbelievable. What would that be like? And then you get on a national and, okay, you know, you might get worked a bit harder, standards might be a bit higher, you might have people who, you know, won't accept certain, you know, you, you might write copy that would be fine at the Echo, but when you write it for a national, they go, no, uh, this isn't our style, we want it like this, we want it like that. But very soon you'll adapt to the culture and most times you'll likely be fine if you've made it that far, if you threw the door in the first place, you got through the door for a reason. So. Yeah, it, it's funny, isn't it? You know, sort of lifting the lid on it all. I always wonder that about, I mean, and we've had, we've had the pleasure of speaking to footballers through the Anfield app, and obviously me and you speak to Steve Warnock regularly, and we've got the show we've got with him. And that that's what I enjoy about that, you know, getting them to sort of lift the lid on. Yeah, you know, we, we rarely put football on a pedestal, don't we, you know, in this country in general. And then, like, when you speak to people who are in it, like, it... it all right, they're well rewarded and all the rest of it, but it still just becomes a job. You know, it still just becomes a group of lads who you see every day, who you work with. And yeah, you know, you compete, You did, it's elite sport, but also it's still a job. It's still a routine. It's still something you do with every day. And it, it's just funny, isn't it, how, how it works? Like, you know, the stuff you don't see, you just, you just naturally... I mean, I, I think it's funny now, you know, with media, because, you know, as I said before, all in the same boat... And, you know, you see, like, on Channel 4, they're doing, like, a, a daily chat show from someone's house. And even, like, um, I got sent something before. It was really interesting. So some of the Sky News stuff, you'll see, you'll see them. You know, they've still got, like, a grand background. They've still got the stuff going along the bottom. And it looks pretty much like what you're used to seeing. Mm. But there's an, there's an account on Twitter, which is basically um, the technicians behind Sky News, and right now, it's a fascinating read because they're putting up on Twitter how they are doing that, and it's from the presenters' homes. And so, it, and it's it's really it's you're like, oh wow, is that? So like, there was one before, and it was like a, te- a, a a telly mounted on the wall, but with like a picture of the White House or whatever on it, and then a stool which the girl was sitting on in front of it. Then obviously the graphics are put on by someone else, and, and like you've got lighting rigs and all that, but it's just in a bedroom, and it's like, it's mad. Do you know that the, the sort of facade of it almost? You know, like because what you say on your telly, it looks all polished and it looks fantastic and looks great. Seeing another one like that as well, um, a lad who presents for um, the Premier League, Premier League Productions, and he was like, "This is my setup at home," and it was like you know laptop, uh, camera, mic. And, like, you know, the actual gear that he had was was nice stuff, don't get me wrong. But it was like, it's just, we're all in the same boat. You know, we're all in this mad situation where we're working out of back rooms. I bet you they've got a window, though. I bet you they have got a window <laughs> more than one. It, it's interesting what, you, what you're what you saying, because one of the things I've always thought, actually, because I, I feel actually quite privileged, because it, it, even when I was a lawyer and I wasn't happy being a lawyer, one of the advances I got was get to see behind the scenes of loads of companies, so I used to work for it. I mean, there were times, I remember one of the stories I always tell is we used to, in, in one of the biggest firms I worked for, we worked for lots of the big international banks. And we were having this conversation with this bank at one point and they were trying to, they, someone had defaulted on like a hundred million pound loan or something like that. And we were like, yeah, we can sort it all out for you. Just send us the original signed documents you've got from when they took the loan on. And this was, this was a com- conference call and they went, um, yeah, we haven't got them. And we were like, sorry, you've, 
you haven't got this original loan documents to prove that they owe you 200 million pounds. They went, yeah. And we went, what, why, what happened? And they went, well, we moved offices last year and we just lost loads of stuff. And I remember from that day, years later, the crash happened and everyone else was shocked. And I was like, nah, once you've seen behind the scenes of all of these places, it, it really helps sort of change your mindset towards other stuff. So it's interesting because someone asked the question on Twitter, Ian Casey, I think that's your name, Ian, I hope I've pronounced that right. Because he was asking, you know, we've both gone on to follow our passion, you with journalism and tour, me leaving the law and going into doing this sort of stuff. And he was saying, can you talk about the, like the first steps to go from turning that passion into a profession? And, it, and it's funny, it's one of the things he ends this question with is where, where the real success started happening. And, and I think one of the, the key points of this and the journeys we've been on is I, I wish more people could see it. And that's one of the reasons I like to share all this stuff is that once yeah. you've seen it and you've seen other people do it, it becomes less frightening because it's just not as complicated and it's not as big a deal as everybody thinks it is really. And yeah. the, the last bit at the end, so it'd be interesting getting you on this, but the last bit at the end when he says, when does the real success start happening? My bit on that is what did, define success. Yeah. Because all the way through, you just get highs and lows all the way through. You might, like even this, I'll start a YouTube channel. It starts, you get some nice com you get some nice comments back, you get some nice feedback, people are subscribing, lovely. It's only a matter of time before someone starts criticizing. Someone will have something negative to say. That's just part and parcel of what you're doing, that's part and parcel of life. But again, yeah. I feel fortunate that I've sort of been practicing for this for years by doing on fear rap stuff. I remember the first ever article I wrote and I and I sent it in probably to you or to Neil and said, Look, I've written this, I don't know whether it's any good. Do you want to put it up? And you read it and I edited it and was like, yeah, it's good that made, we'll put it on. And I remember going through every comment with like a fine tooth comb. The negative comments were really winding me up. But then over time, you just get to a point, not only now do they not wind me up, I actually quite enjoy them. Like I, I enjoy all of that interaction. And when people say, I, I, one of the lines I often say, I'll, I'll be saying this on other, um, other shows as well, the line of, we've talked about this, maybe you're right. I think it was Wayne Dyer, like a famous motivational fella, said that what he likes to say is no matter what anyone says to him, whether he's the best in the world or the worst in the world, he just goes, yeah, maybe you're right. And it's one of the things that's really helped me in, in life that when even when someone's being horrible, if you can just go, yeah, maybe you're right. Like if someone says to me now, that's the worst thing I've ever read. You are a rubbish writer. This channel's crap. You can't speak on camera, but I'm like, yeah. Maybe you're right. That's, because at the same time, you've got other people saying, I've, I've had that. I remember two comments side by side on an article. One said, this is the greatest thing I've ever read. And the next one down said, this is the worst thing I've ever read. I was like, does that just sum up the internet? Yeah, exactly. It does, doesn't it? I mean, on the sort of the wider career thing and sort of how it happens. And yeah, I mean, the success thing's interesting, isn't it? I mean, even that is like a mindset of its own. Like, you know, there's a wider obsession, I think, in society, this constant push that you should be aiming for something else. You should always be looking to climb some kind of ladder. You should always be trying to reach for some higher place. And, you know, I'm 43 now and I'm starting to reach a place now where I'm thinking that, that you know, there is no ladder and there is no higher place. And it's as simple as if you're happy, well, you're happy and that's it. And, like, you know, for some people, happiness will come from working absolutely mad hours, you know, doing your head in over work or whatever. You know, some people like that challenge. Other people equally, you know, will be fine with bringing up kids or whatever it may be. You know, I, I think the, the, the judgment thing that is just around everything around uh, in society is weird. And there's kind of like messages subliminally dripped in all the time that, you know, you need to be reaching out for something else. Like you've done that for five years. Why have you done that? Why aren't you doing something else now? Well, what, what is it I should be doing? Well, why have I got to constantly reinvent myself? Why have I got to think of something else? Like, you know, with this, I mean, you know, with the Amphir app, the Amphir app's not, not down to just me by any stretch. You know, it, it's a group of people, a group of people that worked hard. And even with the Amphir app, as you say, we've had highs and lows. I mean, people might look in from the outside and say, oh, that's, that's fantastic what you've done. And it's a real success. And in many ways, of course, it is. And there's not many, if, if any, podcast companies in, in the country that are doing quite what we're doing in the same way that we're doing it. I mean, there are other podcast companies now, but I think um, in terms of career, I mean, I I actually used to, I don't know if I've ever told you this before, I used to want to be a solicitor when I was in school. Um, 
Yeah. So uh, and I remember, like, I, you know, it's hard, isn't it, to re- to re- you know go back thirty years and remember exactly what you were what you were thinking. But I definitely said it, and I definitely did mean it. And I wrote, I found things that I wrote, you know, wrote it in books or whatever. But I remember I nearly got lashed out of school at one point because it was a bit of a divvy in school, like I don't mind saying. And I remember there being like a bit of a, you know, a, a meeting really, and it was like sort of my form teacher, my head of year, and the headmaster and my dad, and it was like you know, um, deciding whether the, I should be suspended and all that kind of thing, or even expelled maybe. And um, I remember saying in that meeting like, oh, I want, I want to be a solicitor, and they were like, what? And yeah. I was like, I was like, that's what I want. And they were like, why do you want to be that? And I was like, because it's solid work. It's it's a profession. It's well paid. It's well respected. You know, that's what I want to go on to do. Um, and they were like, well, you're not going about about things the right way right now. You know, your your efforts and your application is poor in lessons. You've got a bad attitude. You're hanging around with the wrong people. All of those things. And they, probably, and they were absolutely right, by the way, in, in many of those respects. But I think the fact that I said solicitor at that stage to those people definitely helped me because I didn't get lashed out. And, yeah, and, and, yeah, and almost, almost like an opposite effect in that a couple of those people sort of seemed to me to sort of keep an eye out for me and sort of say to me, listen, you know, you can go somewhere if you want, but you need to want to go somewhere. And I remember... Um, in school, in, in secondary school, I, made, I actually made a fanzine uh, as part of like an English project. I've still got it somewhere. It's called um, Any Spares. Uh, not Spares as in Tottenham, Spares as in spare tickets, because obviously that's what you always heard at the match, and you still, you still do to an extent. You know, Any Spares, lads, Any Spares, Any Spares. So just, I, called, I called my fanzine Any Spares and just wrote like a few articles or whatever, uh, poorly a poorly drawn illustration on the front and I think I got um I think I got a B for it. Like I say I've still got it somewhere. Um and yet like when it comes to the end of school and I do I did all right in school, not no more than that. But my school was a bit mad, I think it's fair. I, I don't think I'm throwing anyone under the bus. It's not there anymore. I knocked it down but um Heighton. Heighton, yeah, bowed and comprehensive in height and and it, it was always like, you know, Nosley was always bottom of the education leagues anyway. Then Bowram was bottom of Nosley, essentially, you know, nine times out of ten. Um, and, you know, various reasons to that, obviously. Um, but I got 1A, 1B, 7 Cs and a D in my GCSEs, which, all right, you know what I mean? But I've got a letter still in my record of achievement saying uh, congratulations on some of the best results ever achieved at Bower and Convent. And it's like, wow. Yeah. But I remember, I remember like, it was weird because, you know, I was a bit of an arsehole and I did act up in school. And I remember, uh, I think because of that, a lot of the teachers th- didn't, didn't back me to go on and do anything really. And that got me back up, I've got to be honest. Like, I remember... Uh, you know, go and find and some of the teachers almost on results day and sort of go like, ah, would be results, you know what I mean? Because they said, like, you know, French teacher said I would never get a C in French. I got a C in French. Um, the English teacher wasn't particularly encouraging. Like, I remember her saying, like, oh, uh, you did all right in the end, Gareth. And I was like, thanks. And she was like, what's the plan now? I said, I'm going to go and do A-levels. And she was like, what A-levels are you thinking of doing? And I said, I want to do English language and English literature. And she went, ooh, I think you might struggle. And I remember thinking, oh, off. And uh, I actually went to, like, the nearest college to me in, in Roby. Because of their, the makeup of their timetable, I couldn't do both Englishes there. I would have had to choose something else. And so because of that, I, w- I went further afield because of what I was determined to do both subjects. And I went to Crompton College instead. Uh, or witness six form college as it was called and I did I did English lang- English literature as an A level languages an AS level and Mrs McKenzie on the off chance that you're watching I got an A in both so that face you pulled at me do you know what I mean <laughs> but uh, like it, but I think it's bad that because I think you know if you're a teacher you should you should be in like mentor mode as much as you can be you know what I mean and and to sort of pull faces or discourage people. I'm not really sure, you know, what the point in that was. Although maybe, you know, maybe and maybe I'm not giving Miss McKenzie enough credit. Maybe she thought the type of personality he's got 
if I tell him he can't do something, he'll go and prove that he can. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, maybe maybe Miss McKenzie's at home now with a big grin on her face. Yeah, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? I mean, one 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 of my history teachers got hold of me like just randomly. We 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 sort of stumbled across each other on Twitter. And like she was that nice, and she was saying it's it's really good to see you doing well and all that kind of stuff, and that that was nice. Like so, yeah, I did did that. Did uni, um, uni. So where did it, where did the switch then come from? Well, I'm really, I'm, I'm conscious we're in danger of slipping into your origin story here, which I know, is yeah, we are, yeah. which is pencil which is penciled in for maybe another show in the future. But just on this point, what where did the solicitor thing then disappear and turn into the journalism thing? I don't know, you know, it's a good question, and I don't know what happened. I think I just, I really got into. I mean, it was I was always into football anyway, but I got really into it at one stage, like obsessively into it, and I was always into, and it just happened naturally. There's not like someone handing me these things. I just got into it myself. I really got into journalism around football from from honestly from an early age. So like, I always bought all the fanzines, and I was always like, I always found them fascinating fanzines. Just that they existed and that the stuff in them was in them, if you know what I mean. Like, you know, pe- people saying what they really thought and it not being presented and it not being polished, it being what fans really thought. That always really interested me. And I've still got to this day loads and loads of like through the wind and the rain, uh, when Sunday comes, low in uh, Liverpool way. You know, there used to be loads of fans in some short lived, some long running, and I've still got loads of them to this day. Um, and I just always found it fascinating, like the jokes in them and the little comics, everything about them. And then I bought like, you know, match and shoot and all that kind of stuff as well. So I think it probably just come from there. And I just thought, you know, I like that. And I used to read, I used to read like uh, fiction um, about football. Do you know what I mean? So like, I mean, I, I, you know, I'd obviously have to like read the classics and all the stuff that you've got to read in school. But I read fiction about football and it always grabbed me as well. I've always been like, I think, like, quite romantic about football, you know, like, so even to this day, like, tactical stuff and things like that, I get it, and I know it's part of the game, but it's not, it's not really for me. I'm more about, I love, like, the crowds, I love the the, the romanticism of it all, that kind of stuff, and I just always want, I think I always wanted to be part of that somehow, and so I started thinking, like, my aim is I want to be in the press box, I want to be writing about Liverpool. So what, how old were you when you were getting into the fan? When you were saying you were getting obsessed with fanzines, how old would that have been? Like 13, 14 in particular, around then. Because mm-hmm. um, remember as well, like, you know, they were really successful at the time and you used to be able to buy some of them in the news agents. You know, you didn't have to go looking for them. Like, they were quite widely available. You could get them in record shops in town. You could obviously get them at the match. I used to buy the odd Blue Nose one as well because, as I say, I was really fascinated with them. I mean, obviously, Liverpool ones were... The ones I was most interested in, but even then I was like, I'd have a look at an Everton one, and I'd have a look at. Well, it was mainly just Everton to be fair. At that time, I wasn't going further afield than that. But I, I was just, yeah, I don't know, I don't know what. I was. I've always been interested in the concept of fans, supporter culture, and all that. I mean, what I obviously wouldn't have been calling it that then. I was just, I was just buying a fanzine and I was interested in it. But um. And it, it's funny now as well, you know, when I look back sometimes at, at an old fanzine and the names in it and stuff like that, and, you know, there are, there are people that have ended up being on the Anfield Rap or there are people who you still see on Twitter, like Stephen Kelly is still on Twitter, who edited uh, Through the Wind and the Rain. Uh, Dave Usher is on Twitter, who um, edited Liverpool Way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know what I mean? And, you know, all, the, all those people, a lot of those people who had that obs- obsession for whatever reason around this. They're still there and they're still writing and they're, they're still producing content as well. But I think in, in terms of thinking it was like a success, if you like, but it's, you know, that's a movable feast, isn't it? But I remember I got some work experience uh, at the Runcorn Weekly News and uh, like, it doesn't sound glamorous, does it? But do you know what? It was fantastic because I, I think I did a month with them in the end. And it was in my final year at uni. And as I had to hand in a portfolio at the end of the semester to be assessed. And but what they said was if you if you get some good work experience, which I did have, um keep you know, keep going to the work experience and submit your stories as part of your portfolio rather than returning to like 
the educational environment, if you like. So I did a full month, even though it was in my last year of, of uni. And they gave me some really big stories. Like, they gave me some proper hard news stories. Like, I remember doing something, a big feature on um, the use of cannabis for medicinal reasons. And there was actually a fella who, uh, from Runcorn, who was getting it for his wife, who had um, MS. And, um, you know, she she found that it was the only thing that helped, basically. And, and you know, he, he went to court for it and he got done. Um, and so I, I interviewed like, you know, professors and people in medicine and, and all kinds and wrote this big feature and it went in the paper. And OK, it's only the run call we could use, but let's not, you, you can't overstate how good that was for, you know, sort of 20 year old me or 21 year old me. I was I was over the moon to have, to have something printed in the paper. Well, it's interesting because on, on, going back to that question, when pe- I think when people think about first steps for anything, even that they can blow out of proportion. Like first steps in in that story there, and without sort of delving into the detail too much, because I, I would actually really like to to do this at some point as a as a full show and and go right the way through your story. But even then, your first step can be go and get work experience with someone. Yeah. You know, go 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 to like you just said. Then doesn't sound glamorous. The local run corn paper. But it's experience. It's, it, when we're talking about first steps, it's baby steps often. Like even I'll say to people, the, the, the very first step is making the decision to do it. Because without the decision to do it, you'll never do it. I remember what, one of my very good mates actually I went to uni with. Years and years ago, he was talking to me about he, he would love to be a sports journalist. And I remember going through and I, I set up my law firm and I was always you know, the type of person who would say, well, do it then. Do yeah. it. And I was trying to encourage him, just start writing. He's a Chef United fan. Just start writing, just start writing. And he never did. And then all these years later, I remember, you know, I, I got to a point then where I'm basically writing for a sports podcast website. I'm, I'm the one. I, I never even wanted to do it. Never thought about doing it. And I'm there writing and saying to him, it wasn't that difficult, mate. Like, I literally wrote something and sent it to them and said, what do you think of that? And they said, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Just, do it. just, just do something. I always say that to people: just do something and see where it goes. Absolutely, because um, I think the other thing is as well. You know, you say about work experience. I think you know there can be good and bad work experience, and and like you know, if you have some bad work experience, I like, don't be afraid to a just say, well, that was bad work experience, or or b as well, you know, ch- challenge it a little bit while you're there. I mean, I I got some work, work experience with Radio City. When I was, you know, in my early days, and um, shit, it, it, it was no good for me. So I went, I went in sort of day one, day two, or whatever, and they were giving me little bits and bobs. And I remember going out on the streets and doing a vox pop, um, asking people whether Paul Ince was the uh, final piece in the jigsaw uh, for Liverpool and things like that. And I can remember um, doing a piece about some German fella who um, bought a bin. You know, like the black Liverpool bins with the gold on and the uh, and the, like the liver bed and all that. He, he, for some reason, he fell in love with those bins, and after like a long time of trying, like the council agreed <laughs> agreed to sell him one, uh, and he was taking it back to Germany. And like you know, mad story, but it's quite good. So at first, I was like, oh, this is good. You know, I'm getting experience. I'm going out and doing stuff, and then it it, it, it sort of dropped away quite quickly. And then one of them who worked there at the time was quite snotty with me and said, like, you know, there's no way you can ever work in any form of broadcast with that accent. I, uh, yeah, here, here I am working in some form of broadcast with that accent. And, <laughs> and you know, of course, like, the Alfie Rapp ended up with a show on City Talk of its own. Um, so, you know, again, sort of, like, not... And I, I remember saying to them in the end, I think, I think you know, I was down for a certain time period and I said to, like, a couple of them were all, you know, it wasn't across the board, they were all crap. It was just, you know, a couple of, it was fair to say there was different attitudes towards the person on work experience from different people at that time. Some dead helpful, some not so. Yeah. And I remember just saying in the end to, to like, the, the news editor, I think it was at the time, I just said, listen, uh, I think I've took some really good stuff from from this period of time. I said, but equally, I don't think there's much more points in me ca- coming in if if those are what my days are going to look like. 
Because for me, I was spending too much time just sitting there doing nothing. And and he was like, no, fair enough. And he was all right with me. He was like really straight with me. He's like, no, fair enough. Uh, really honest of you to say. And he's like, if you want to put this down as, you know, I was on work experience here. He said, I'll, I'll vouch for you as, as as having done a good job type of thing. I was like, thanks very much. And I and, and moved on. But I think what's interesting in sort of just sort of taking a point, punt and your mate there who didn't do it, I reached a point in my career where I was doing stuff I didn't want to do. I know you did as well. Um, but I was like, I was doing journalism and I was doing PR and I was working for council. So I was doing stuff that was like, <clears throat> within my skill set, if you like. And it you know, it was earning all right money and things like that. But I just had this sort of nagging thing in my head. It's not what I want to do though. It's not football. It's not that thing I dreamt about when I was in school, when I was writing a little fanzine, you know, and and I still wanted to do that, but I just wasn't getting anywhere. Like I wasn't getting any sports jobs. I couldn't force my way in despite my best efforts. And I remember just thinking, I'm just gonna start a blog. I'll just start a blog. And, and so I just started a blog, called it Well Read, and just started writing about Liverpool for, for the benefit of no one other than myself, really, if I'm being honest, when I first wrote it. Like, the very first piece I ever wrote on it was sort of how I fell in love with football and, and how I got into it. Because I think, you know, my story, and if we're going to do that, I won't talk about it too much, but, you know, it isn't that typical, I don't think, of, like, a Merseyside lad in that I didn't have, like the father figure who loved it or anything like that. It was it was off my own bat. So I wrote this piece and I remember I remember showing it to a monk fella actually. And I was like, what do you think of that? And he went, so I'll have a read of that on my dinner. And then he'd worked in journalism and stuff. And he, he, he'd just come back and he was like, on the end of his dinner, and he said, hey, it's great that. And he's like, he's like, it's funny, isn't it? Um, how you can take to something so quickly if you're passionate about it. That was that was what he said to me at the time, and I was like, "Is that?" I said, "Is that what you thought?" He went, "That's great." I said, "Honestly," and he said, and, uh, "It was a great read." And he said, "Keep going, keep doing it." And then, like, it sort of just went like mu- like mushroom with no like not loads of effort on my behalf. I just kept regularly posting to it, and more and more people got onto it, and then people were sharing it on forums and things like that, and then. You know that eventually become a fanzine, and then, you know, and then we did the Amphi rap. The people I know on the Amphi, you know, the reason that the, the reason I had a conversation with Andy Heaton about the Amphi rap and about the idea of doing a podcast all those years back was because he knew me because of Well Read. Mm. So you know, like without me taking the punt on writing that first blog post, we wouldn't be here now having this conversation. Um. So, and then when the Amphi rap sort of was getting somewhere and and was you know, going well. Um, I think certainly a marker of success was when it was time to take a risk, really, and, and quit a full-time job at the Mirror, which a lot of people would look at and say, well, that's great. Um, but I quit that, and I was like, right, let's go all in on, on the Anfield app. And, um, you know, I was one of the first to take the plunge and say, okay, let's go and do it. Um, I remember a lot of people saying to me, are you sure? Are you sure? Like, people in journalism, you know, like, good people as well, not like just being negative, but just being like, are you sure you want to walk away from this? Because this is like regular income. You know, you're on a national newspaper. You know, it could lead somewhere else for you. If you walk away, you try this and it doesn't work, are you sure you can get back again? And I was like, well, I'll never know if I don't try. Do you know what I mean? And and at that, you know, what you talked about before, about when you're like, how things look from the outside and the reality of them. So, okay, to you, to whoever, they might be going, oh, you work for the better, like national newspaper. Wow, that must have been fantastic. Yeah, but when I was on the early shift and I had to be in Oldham for 7 a.m., wasn't that good, you know? (laughs) I'd much rather be in the back room of a flat with no windows in Liverpool. Thanks very much. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and you know what, mate? It's really, that's fascinating. A question I've got you before, because we, I want to go on to talk about Mandy Allen sent in a question as well, which oh, yeah. ties massively into this. Um, but a, a, an interesting question on that point was, how sure were you? Like, if you had to rank it from a scale of zero being you weren't sure at all to 10 being you were absolutely sure it was the right thing to do, how sure were you at the time? On taking the plunge full-time with the Amphi Yeah. 
I, I, I was certain that it was the right thing to do. Not, not just on, like, I wasn't certain in, th- in terms of it's definitely 100% going to be a success and it's going to reach where we are now with it. I think I, I think most of us have been honest along those lines and said it's, it's gone way beyond what we ever thought it could go get to. What I did think, though, was that it was capable of sustaining a full-time living for a few of us. I thought that. Um, but I, I just, you know, I had no ideas what kind of numbers it was going to do long term and things like that. But what I did think as well was, and it did play into it, I just thought, well, look, you know, I think I could get back to the likes of the mirror if, if I needed to. I, I think, and, and I wasn't enjoying it. Like I say, you know, there was other aspects to it. It wasn't just getting up dead early in the morning to be an old and it was sort of where journalism was going at that time and things like that. You know, this was a, the clickbaity stuff and things like that. And, you know, this is the dramatic moment when X, Y, Z. That wasn't really for me. Like, I, I, I didn't like that type of journalism. And, and I know, like, that's the direction a lot of it's gone in now. And, like, you know, so, so I didn't like having to follow a list of, you know, these are the stories you're working through today. And a lot of them... You know, you're rewriting things or you're writing things about a fella on the internet with a millipede in his ear or whatever. And it's just like, it's not it's not my idea of journalism. I mean, I know it is journalism and I know people do click it and do like it, so sound. But I wasn't enjoying it anyway. And I just thought, the outfit app can be an adventure. It's something new. It's a challenge. It's different. Let's see where it can go. We can make our own rules almost with this. And that, you know, that appealed to me. Yeah, that's fascinating. Like, it, it, and the reason I ask that question is I'm, I, I work with my own coaches for like to help me with my stuff still, and because I'm a, I'm a massive advocate of the stuff I, I talk about. Basically, It'd be hypocritical if I wasn't. And one of the things, even just this morning, we were doing a, a I was reviewing old decisions I've made based on, based against the, the essential human needs. Two of them being, it, it's really interesting because two of them are certainty and uncertainty. We need both. It, and depending yeah. on your personality, you need it to different amounts. And it was funny looking back over the big decisions I've made in my life. The way you answered that question is exactly how I felt at each time. I was certain it was the right decision, but I was completely uncertain as to whether it could work or not. Mm. So it was like a, it was a visceral feeling. It was emotional. It was when people were saying to me, is this the right thing to do? I wasn't like, on paper, it's the right thing to do. On paper, it probably wasn't the right thing to do. If you if you add up to the like the logical ticks that people expect of you, yeah. But there was a there was a risk involved in it, and I, and I think that's interesting. And Mandy's question was, um, which I think is fascinating on on this point for anybody who hasn't done this and who's and anybody who's sort of waiting and hanging on and thinking should they make a change in their lives? Do you think this situation will change you in any way going forward? And what about society in general? And my take on that is it'd be interesting to hear what you say. But I, I watched, this might sound like a mad analogy, I watched Fight Club again a couple of weeks ago. And it's one of my favourite movies. And I've realised lately that movies are very like important in my life. The stories in movies at key times, I take loads from them. And if, for anyone who, who hasn't seen Fight Club, and if you, even if you have, you'll remember, there's, there's a scene where Brad Pitt's character, Tyler Dead, and one of my favourite movie characters of all time, takes a, a, a fella out of a shop, puts him on his knees in... The, the car park of this, like, it's like a spa, like a 24-7 shop. And he puts a gun to the back of his head and says to this fella, what did you want to do with your life? And the fella's crying and he says, I wanted to be a vet. I wanted to be a, a veterinary surgeon. And he says, right, I'm going to come back and see you in six weeks. And if you haven't started taking steps to become a vet, I'm going to shoot you in the back of the head. And this fella runs off screaming. And Ed Norton's character says to Brad Pitt, to Tyler Durden, that's mad. What have you just done that for? And he said, tomorrow, is, he's going to wake up and he's going to have the greatest day of his life. He's going to feel free. He's going to think, I've got to go and do the thing I wanted to do now. And I keep chatting to people about the coronavirus and, and saying, the coronavirus could be for, every, for, for lots of people who are open to it like Brad Pitt with a gun against your head, because everyone's got loads of time to sit and think, yeah. do I like what I'm doing? When, when people are getting laid off from work, when you're getting furloughed, it's a chance to sit back and go, do I like this though? If, if the world came to an end in six months, if this was it, am I, am I good with what I've been doing? Or should I just take that chance? Should I just go and do that thing that I've always wanted to do or I've been thinking about doing and I've just held off for whatever reason? And I'm hopeful, actually, 
that that is a change that that, that could come about. I, I think it's an opportunity as well, just to think about every aspect of your life from the very smallest thing to to the biggest thing. Because as you say, we've got time on our hands, and you know, for for, for you and me right now, we're spending a lot of time on our own as well. So you know, whether you, obviously there's a danger of overthinking and negative thinking and, and that kind of stuff. But equally, though, I think it's a you can you can use it for for positive thinking as well. And what, what I've been doing, and I've thought about it before, I've read it somewhere along the way, and I've obviously got it from somewhere. This is how these things work, isn't it? But I started to think about sort of like the speed of things, almost the, the, where the dial is on your life, if you know what I mean. And so what I mean by that is, <coughs> like, do you wake up in the morning and almost race through brushing your teeth because you want to get to the next task? Do you make something shift for your tea because you want your tea out the way? for some other task that you think might be important. And what I've been doing is just slowing down on everything, even from brushing my teeth. I've just gone like, why am I racing through brushing my teeth? Just brush your teeth. Mm. Just brush your teeth at, 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 at a slow pace. There's no need. It's not a race. And like with my tea as well, it's like, you know, yeah, I could throw something in the oven for 20 minutes and it'll be done when twenty after 20 minutes. And then I can race through it and I can wash the dishes and done. And then I'm, I'm, there's, there's some imaginary task that's dead important. But eating's like a really basic need. Like you've got to eat, so why not enjoy the eating and enjoy the cooking process and make something that is healthy is nice and that you take some kind of enjoyment out of making. So you know, this is only just over the last few days. I've just been making a little bit more effort. No, I'm, I'm not turning into Gordon Ramsay overnight, but you know, cooking fresh things and just you know avoiding stuff that's in the freezer a bit more and things like that. And you do 100% feel better for it. You get a little sense of achievement that you're bothered to make those things. It's actually nice when you're eating it. It's not just bland. It's not cardboardy. You're not ticking a box going, yes, I have had a meal. So things like that as well. I know people will will definitely think about bigger picture things, about relationships, about careers, about things like that. But I think, as I say, it's a time maybe to think about really little things as well. Even the news thing, like I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that I'm, I'm, only, I'm only consuming half an hour or so of news a day because I know for a fact that if I sat here watching rolling news or continually clicking onto BBC News to see what the latest was, that would be really bad for me. But I'm, I'm glad that I've managed to find the place now where I know that would be really bad for me. And so I'm not, I'm not getting involved in it. Half an hour is absolutely fine. And so it's maybe a time to find, break old habits that are bad habits find new ones that are good ones. And then hopefully when you return to normal life, as everyone keeps calling it, you know, you can take some of those new habits with you. I mean, the the thing that uh, I sent you before, which was about, you know, everyone saying, oh, I haven't got time to work out. And yet if you worked out for five minutes, well, you just worked out. Mm. Um, and, you know, like, I haven't got time to read. Well, if you read for five minutes, you've read. Do you know what I mean? I haven't got time to write, write for five minutes you've written, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, you know, that's from um, James Clear, who I think I've mentioned to you before, but he's, he's really good. Like his book, his, his book's about habit and it is a really good book. But what I really like as well is there's an email you can sign up for, comes every Thursday and it's really sm- like the smallest points ever. He, he just sends you three points and each one is basically a sentence or so, but they, they make you think and it just drops in your inbox every Thursday. You read it and go, yeah, I like that. Or or, or, or you might think not of it, or it might pass you by. But, you know, even if it's like a hit rate of sort of five and ten or whatever, they're just useful little reminders and just useful little things where you can, that, that gets something positive going in your head. So that five-minute thing that, that I sent to you, that was from his email today. It's Thursday today. That's where I got it from. Um, so it's that kind of stuff. And then it just... You know, it's like me, like I want, like I've got these things that are always wearing around my head, like, you know, I want, I've got a banjo, I got it for my birthday a few years ago, and I want to be able to play it, but I never have a go of it. But now I've got it in my head going, well, what if I just picked it up for five minutes? Yeah. I can definitely pick it up for five minutes, can't I? Yeah. And then, but then I'm starting to build a new habit, aren't I? And, you know, I've got a guitar, the other side of this screen looking at me. Again, I haven't picked that up for ages. And it's just laziness as well because I think oh, it'll need tuning that 
Do you know what I mean? I can't just pick it up and pay a chord. It'll need tuning first. So, how long is it going to take to tune? Do you know what I mean? Like, sort of getting onto those little mental traps, I think, of why you put, put things off. I think, you know, now is a perfect time to to be thinking about stuff like that, but not beating yourself up over it. Just having a, a think, but a positive think about it. I think uh, one other one as well, um, which I am doing, and again, I've took this from a book somewhere, but a good one, I think, is um, just being nice to yourself. I mean, I know I was watching some of your content on your, on your site before, and you were touching on some of this, about what, what you actually think of yourself and your own image of yourself. And without getting into that, because that is obviously quite deep. This is this is this is not deep. This is just simply things like if you like getting a bath and a bath makes you feel good, get a bath. Why can't you have a bath? Do you know what I mean? Things like that. And and you know, like if you like if you love spaghetti bolognese, but not out of a tin, made from fresh, make it. Yeah. You know, and just sort of build like like build those things in, you know, a a, a thing. Maybe not every day, but you know, just a thing—a thing that you know makes you like makes you feel good. Because I think you can get into traps of like if you've got kids, always always thinking about the kids. Of course, you think about the kids. Of course, you love the kids. But but have you ended up in a place where you're always thinking about them? Work work's important, but are you always thinking about work? Like and 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 you know, trying to find the balance and including in that balance something you're into something that makes you feel good something that's nice for you i think there's loads of people that never do that and i read that in a book and i remember thinking that's brilliant that just you know like if you're feeling down you're feeling anxious whatever do something that makes you feel nice that you that you know you like and don't feel guilty for it just do it yeah i love all that stuff mate i think that and i think it's it's, it's brilliant advice it's, it's something i'm I've, I've been thinking about doing a full video on actually because there's loads and loads of advice going around right now about how to stay sane during this period. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Just notice we've been chatting for an hour now, so we'll, we'll probably wrap up. But we'll, if if people like this, we'll we'll chat again because I love these chats. But um, we'll chat again either way, whether whether we feel that. Yeah. We that or, <laughs> but, but something I've noticed is, and we've talked about this, is the the clash. There's always a clash. It's like you've got to pick one camp. So there's like one camp that says you've got to be dead productive. And if you don't come out the other side of this speaking Spanish, playing your guitar and all the rest of it, then you've wasted your time. And then there's the other camp that says, you should just be sitting in your pyjamas watching Netflix. Don't worry about it. And I keep looking at that and thinking, it's whatever. Be kind to yourself. If you wake up today and, as you say, you want to have a bath, just have a bath and tell yourself that's okay. And if you yeah. wake up tomorrow and you want to play five minutes on your guitar, play five minutes on your guitar and tell yourself it's okay. Whichever Whatever you and I, I, I'm literally practicing what I preach, Joe. This and it sounds like you're doing the same thing. And I'm just, I have to practice it as well. I've Joe, by no means am I like Yoda with this. I'm like, oh, I've got it all figured out. <laughs> but the days where I still find myself beating myself up, and I have to, I have to remind myself. And that's why it's good to have people around like you and a handful of other people who I have these chats with, and it reminds me. And something I like about one of the reasons I've done this channel actually is someone said to me ages ago, teaching other people the stuff you've learned helps you to learn it again you just yeah, keep it over and over again and with this stuff i always say to people it's like going to the gym i saw tony robbins get interviewed once and someone said to him so when do you get to stop doing all this stuff and he just laughed Never. it's like saying to me if you've got in dead good shape when do you get to stop going to the gym you can stop but then you're going to get out of shape again if you want to continue it you've got to keep working on it and it doesn't have to be dead hard work it's literally just every day it's all right if I want to go back to bed. If I'm tired yeah. and I'm not in work, I can go back to bed for an hour. If, I'm, if I don't want to do any work and I don't have to, I can watch Netflix for two hours. That's great. You said before we started recording, chatting to your mom, and I'm, I'm exactly the same. Watch something funny. Watch something you like. Listen to a song that cheers you up. These little things, we, we, I mean, even as I say that, we talk about them like they're little things and they're not. They're everything. Yeah. Like it's your whole life. And we just, if we can take a step back from that whole beating yourself up about, um, do you know why I haven't learned? I'm the same as you. I've got a guitar here. And for the first time in 10 years, I'm like, I've had a little go of that. And I've had a little go. And I can play a few bars, a few chords of a few songs. And I'm like, I'm happy with that. Yeah. If in a month I can play one song, I'll be made up. That's it. I can, I can imagine coming out. And my mum said to me the other day, oh, well, by the time you come out of this, 
you'd be able to play all the songs, you'd be able to give us a show. And I'm thinking, typical. Like, <laughs> yeah, already setting the expectations too high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One song will do me. Like, if I can play a good Oasis song, I'm done, I'm happy. And then once I've done that one song, I can learn another one. I, I think I think a good thing that's come out of this as well is just sort of like little little nice things like you know about music like like I, said, I mentioned before I'm listening to well more music now than I, than I would ordinarily, but what I've, what I've also done is sort of started building little things into my daily routine which other people have built into their daily routine and what I mean by that is so Andy Bell who was in Oasis and Ride um, every day now. He's coming on and, and he's just playing a bit of guitar. Like it can be a little solo, it can be a little bit part of a song. And he just puts it on Instagram, but he puts it on every day. And it's obviously become part of his routine. It's now part of my routine to watch it. Yeah. And I and he actually responded to one of the songs that I asked for as well. And I also put on another day, I just put like, keep doing this. This is great. And he's like, will do, mate. I haven't got anything else to do. But, you know, <laughs> But just getting a message back from like someone I look up to, I was like, yes, Andy Bell replied to me. But e- equally as well, like uh, there's other people doing it now. Where uh, Ben Otterwell, who's the people might not know, but he used to sing in a band called uh, Gomez, who who was successful so uh, in the '90s. Surprise, surprise. But he's on his own now, uh, doing his own stuff as well as stuff with Gomez. And every day he comes on with his daughter. She's only little, and like she dances around, and he plays one of the songs on the acoustic. But it's dead nice, you know what I mean? It, it's nice to see him. It's nice to see his daughter, who's obviously absolutely loving it, and it, it's obviously become part of their routine. Like he even said on one of them, here, we've got, we've done the homeschooling for today, and Alice wants us to do a song, so we're doing X. And it's obviously a thing in their house right now, but it's that nice. And I think little things like that, like I just want to quickly mention, uh, Tim Burgess from the Charlatans came up with the idea of these listening parties. Now, sort of past me, if you like, would have been like fuck that off, you know what I mean, I'm not doing that and all that kind of stuff, but I just thought, you know what, fuck it, like, what else am I doing, like, I'm sitting around in the flat, I'm watching the telly, I'm doing bits and bobs of work, whatever, and I, but it was about one of my favourite albums, so I thought, I'm going to have a go at that, and like, it was on, I think it was on last Thursday, 10pm, and the idea is that simple, you go on Twitter, at the time of the listening party, you listen to, you start the album at 10 o'clock, so does everyone else, and then you have a conversation and you hashtag your conversation. And like people in the band are, are tweeting. So, like, so it, it was Ride and it was Ride's album, uh, Go and Blank Again. But you had Andy Bell on there and you had the drummer on there, Loz, talking about when they recorded it, why they called it that name, you know, where, where this solo come from. You know, Tim Bear just gets involved as well because he was in a band around the same era and he was saying, I was made to mark the singer. And, blah. and it equally, like, you know, fans are throwing stuff in there as well, pictures, ticket stubs, videos, whatever. And it was, do you know what? It was fantastic because right now we are all to an extent locked up a little bit more than, than we would be ordinarily. And it gave you that community sense of, of being part of something. Do you know what I mean? And, and it was really nice and it was really good and it was really positive. So all those little things that have come out of it have been really good. And I, and I hope stuff like that continues. I, I think I told you as well about um, I had a drink with my mates over Zoom. Um, and I'd never done that before. And like I'd sort of semi-suggested it a, a few weeks ago and it never got much traction. And then one of the other lads properly picked up the baton, to be fair to him, and said, right, I've looked into this. All download Zoom and 8.30 on Friday. Get round your computer, your laptop, your tablet, whatever it may be. Get yourself a drink, and we're all going to have a we'll just have a chat like this with a drink. And there was a few cynics about the idea and all that, but we did it. Eight of us were on there, and um, we ended up like speaking to like midnight. And uh, you know, got through some ale as well. But it, you know what? It was it was great because you know we can't go to the pub right now. We can't socialise in all the normal ways. We can't go to the football, but we had to go at this. And it was great as well because like you know, two of my really good mates. One lives in Norwich, and one lives near Valencia. So obviously, I don't see them face to face much anyway. And there they were, you know, on my screen. You know, and even just things like stupid jokes, facial expressions, impressions of you know, things that you know that they can do. Like we were talking about phone jacker. One of the lads does an impression of, of a, uh, you know, George off phone jacker and things like that. Just daft things that you would, you would do in the pub if you were with them. 
because you're getting that face-to-face interaction the day, it, it was really good. And, and by the end of it, the lads who live far away were like, whatever happens now with coronavirus and all the rest of it, when we do return the other side of it, can we can we still do these? Because this is great. So, you know, I think I think little things like that, it, it's making you, or it's making me anyway, sort of a, a appreciate what you've got and appreciate how important certain people are in your life. So with that, mate. Feels like a nice place to end. <laughs> We've done an hour and ten minutes of chatting shit to each other. Boss, um, boss, I enjoy them. Yeah, me too. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for for tuning in. Let us know whether you enjoyed it, whether you want more of it, whether you've got any feedback, good or bad. Any other questions you want us to answer? No, we only got through a couple because we we are good at chatting shit to each other. It turns <laughs> out, which we I think we already knew. Yeah. Um, but that's it. Yeah, thanks for thanks for tuning in. We will be back again soon.